This is undeniably Aston Martin's worst ever car. It was built to race at the Le Mans 24 hours, but it constantly broke down and it was eventually abandoned. However, the car was a fascinating design and went on to have a bizarre racing life. This is the story of the Aston Martin AMR1 Le Mans prototype. Aston Martin Racing had been competing at Le Mans for some time with huge success and popularity. Firstly with the DBR9 GT car and later with a reworked Lola B0860. But for the 2011 season, Aston Martin and ProDrive, which actually ran the racing operation, wanted to step up to the top category properly. There were some rule changes and it meant that to be competitive they would need an all new car. So Aston Martin decided to develop its own brand new LMP1 car from scratch. This was a bold move. Aston Martin would be taking on new cars from both Audi and Peugeot. Time was against ProDrive in the car's development. From the very first design work beginning to the first shakedown of the car was just six months. That's an exceptionally short lead time. It was an especially bold move as ProDrive had never designed and built a car from scratch before. Its WRC and GT cars had always been built around an existing model, the Subaru Impreza most famously. However, the team had quite quietly designed some Formula 1 cars in the past, but when it actually attempted to enter the World Championship in 2010, it planned to do so using a modified McLaren chassis. Indeed, building the new Aston Martin Le Mans car was a real stretch for ProDrive as an organisation, as it was also developing the Mini WRC at the same time. With the Aston Martin, the first decision that ProDrive had to make was whether to build an open car or a closed top car. Closed cars offered aerodynamic advantages with a significant drag reduction, but open cars were much quicker in terms of pit stops with driver changes while open cars were also lighter. Additionally it was felt that open cars offered much better visibility and they also didn't get so hot in the cockpit which would take a toll on driver fitness. These were both important factors as Aston Martin intended to sell the new car to privateer teams which may not have had drivers who were as experienced as they would be in a works team. So Aston Martin opted for an open car believing that the aerodynamic gains of a closed car were pretty minor and the advantages of an open car were more suitable for future customer teams. Notably, both Audi and Peugeot opted for closed roof cars. The AMR1 was launched without really major fanfare, but its design was striking, though perhaps not especially pretty. The official press release said that Aston Martin's in-house design team worked closely with the engineers at Aston Martin Racing to find the optimum balance between aesthetics and aerodynamics. Well, it never saw the inside of a wind tunnel and all of the aerodynamic work was done in CFD. The result was a very high-nosed design, aimed at directing much of the airflow through the car rather than around it. This concept resulted in a rather slab-sided look to the car, but this aerodynamic concept also meant that the internal layout of the mechanical component components would have to be arranged around the tunnels through the car, something that made packaging quite difficult. Note the tunnels either side of the nose. The upper ducts fed cooling airflow to the heat exchangers under the bodywork. You can see that ducting here. Note the asymmetric layout of inlets on the bodywork, particularly the one on the right rear wheel arch, as well as the smaller inlet next to the driver's head. The neat onboard electronics package came from Cosworth. Take a look at the small adjustable windscreen around the cockpit as well. Here's a good look at the rollover structures behind the driver's head. These rollover blades had become a bit of a trend in race car design at the time, as many teams felt that they offered an aerodynamic advantage over the conventional roll hoops as seen on this Lola. They'd actually first been seen in F1 in the mid-1980s, but they'd been revived by Italian company SLC, or ATR as it was later known, with its uh, Formula 3 specification SLC R1 of 2005. ATR was also heavily involved with the 2006 Courage LC70 LMP1 design, which also featured the blades. Audi Sport had also opted to put blades on its R10 Le Mans car as well. In fact, the blades became increasingly popular in open car design overall, including in Formula 1. Indeed, the last Formula 1 roll blade design was seen as recently as 20. 2023 on a Sauber. The AMR1 chassis design was relatively conventional from a mechanical point of view. The carbon fibre monocoque was designed to have pushrod actuated spring and damper units mounted at the top of the tub with a third element in between them. A similar arrangement was found at the rear of the car with the dampers mounted on top of the gearbox casing. The gearbox itself was a transfer six-speed unit by Extrac. As with Audi and Peugeot, the AMR1 opted for wider front tyres which came with an aerodynamic 
drag penalty, but Aston Martin thought that this was the right way to go despite the aerodynamic drag as the other two works teams were also doing it, so they knew that that's where all the tyre development work would be put in by Michelin, so it was really important to have those wider front tyres to not miss out on that tyre development work. The braking system came from Italian company Brembo with 380mm carbon discs at the front and 355mm discs at the rear. At the heart of the AMR1 was a brand new bespoke 2 litre turbocharged straight 6 engine featuring direct injection. It was an extremely unusual engine configuration in racing and at that capacity level and one that ultimately didn't work very well. In theory, this new engine, though, could produce 540 brake horsepower. It had been felt that the straight six design offered a number of packaging advantages. While it was longer than a four cylinder engine, or indeed a V8, it was narrower and lower. Although in theory it had more friction than an inline four cylinder engine, it also had less than a V8. I do wonder, though, if some marketing concerns were present in the decision about which engine configuration to go for. A four cylinder Aston Martin doesn't sound quite right to me, but a straight 6 Aston Martin was far from unusual. Just look at the DB7. Although the initial design of the engine began as far back as 2009, the engine really only had a six month development period as well, like the rest of the car. And ultimately, that was just not long enough. It had its first run on the dyno about eight or nine weeks before the car raced for the very first time. And the final design, while it did prove to be very lightweight, it also proved to be hugely unreliable. One of the key design objectives around the engine was its installation in the car. And despite the small size of the engine overall, the turbocharger location was problematic and caused some real thermal management issues for the car overall, which in turn limited the output of the engine. So a new location had to be found for the turbocharger for Le Mans, but it was very much an interim solution. A twin turbo layout was considered, as it was felt that despite the increased complexity of having two small turbochargers, it would be easier to package them in the back of the AMR1 than one single larger turbo. But I think this really starts to highlight some of the deep problems with the AMR1 as a whole. The engine was specifically designed for the car, yet it didn't really fit, or at least not comfortably, when it absolutely should have been a match made in heaven. Once installed in the car, Car, the engine, which wasn't fully stressed, proved to be deeply unreliable. It was found late on that the car's auxiliary drive pulley, which drove the alternator and the water pump, was cracking. It was machined from billet aluminium and featured some lightening holes, and these were quite important. New stronger steel pulleys were quickly produced to replace the cracked aluminium parts, but these heavier designs impacted some other aspects of the engine, and the vibrations that resulted ultimately destroyed the engine's ability to exist. David Richards of ProDrive later admitted that developing the engine from scratch was probably a bit too ambitious, and in hindsight perhaps the team should have considered installing a different interim engine, at least until the six-cylinder was fully ready. But the company simply didn't have the resources at the time. Indeed, resource management seemed to be one of the biggest problems for the project, as the AMR1 and Mini WRC both needed to use the same limited manufacturing capability at the same time. Outsourcing proved to be difficult too, as when the AMR1 was in build, so were the 2011 Formula 1 cars, and the F1 teams were using up much of the available third-party manufacturing capability in the UK. I think this is part of the reason that the car appeared to be quite poorly finished when it arrived at Le Mans. There were visibly mismatched panels, as you could see in these images. Note the rusty fastener on the nose structure. That's just not the level of fit and finish you'd normally expect from either Pro or Aston Martin. The car just didn't look finished, and the team just looked tired and fed up before qualifying had even started. Le Mans scrutineering for the Aston Martin was conducted in the pouring rain. The reality is the mechanics and team at Aston Martin knew what was coming. The car's first race was the 2011 Six Hours of Castellet. In qualifying, it was over five seconds a lap slower than the Lola car that was on pole. To add insult to injury, that pace-setting Lola utilised the exact same chassis that Aston Martin had designed the AMR1 to replace, albeit the Lola was fitted with a Toyota engine. Indeed, Aston Martin at that race was slower than all but two of the LMP2 entries. It didn't get much better. The Aston Martin struggled around the Castellet circuit for 96 laps with many, many pit stops and wasn't a classified finisher. This dismal performance saw ProDrive withdraw the car from the Spa six hours in order to be better prepared for Le Mans, but it didn't really help. At Le Mans, two AMR1s appeared, but they were both woefully slow, and continued to be dogged by reliability.
reliability issues in practice. In qualifying, the fastest of the two Astons was 20 seconds off the pace set by Audi, and the second car was a second and a half slower than the first. Indeed, the Aston Martin proved to be quicker than only one other LMP1 car, the highly experimental Areca Volkswagen Hybrid. The qualifying performance resulted in the Aston Martins having to bear the indignity of lining up on the grid behind much of the LMP2 field. The race was even worse, uh, but it was also mercifully short. The engine on the 007 car failed after just two laps, while the 009 car managed just two more laps than that, got to lap four before its six-cylinder motor expired. It's fair to say then that the AMR1 was an embarrassing failure, and Aston Martin reverted to using its old Lolas once more. There were some suggestions of reviving the AMR1 project later in the year, but ultimately it was cancelled and Aston Martin essentially tried to forget it ever happened. Though this was not the last time that the AMR1 ever raced, but it was the last time as an Aston Martin. Six AMR1s were due to have been built and all of them were sold in advance to customers reputedly for a million pounds each. However, once the project was cancelled, most of the customers were refunded, though Roald Gota of the Rothko collection opted to keep his Golf liveried car. That was chassis number two, which had raced at Le Mans as car 009. The car which raced as 007 was chassis number one, and that much more recently was sold to a private collector by a company in the US. UK. A third chassis had also been built. It didn't ever race as an AMR1, but it can now be seen in a corner of the Panos Museum in Brazelton, Georgia. How it got there is another very interesting story, which we will cover on this channel in future. I don't believe any more than those three tubs though were ever built. After the failure of the AMR1 project, Aston Martin focused purely on GT racing, and that was the case right up to 2025, when Aston Martin returned to Le Mans with the new Valkyrie Le Mans hypercar. So if you've enjoyed this reliability challenge story of failure at Le Mans, don't worry, there's an awful lot more to come, so don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you very soon down in the pit lane.